Our guest speaker tonight is um, an alumni of this, pro of this college. He earned his uh, Master of Urban Planning degree here. Before Dow Constantine became the King County, well, he actually became King County Executive in 2009. And prior to that, he served eight years on the King County Council. And uh, before that, he sort of helped manage things in Olympia because he spent six years in the legislature, two years or two terms in the House, and two and one term in the Senate. Um, he's a triple husky. He's wearing a purple tie tonight. He obviously has purple blood. There's not too many people that I know have three degrees from the University of Washington. Um, he got his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science in 1985. Then he decided he was going to be a lawyer and got a, a Juris Doctorate degree in 1989 and then decided maybe urban planning was where he wanted to go. And so he came back and got a Master of Urban Planning in 1992. So which discipline he relates to, I think they all are kind of melded together in the kind of job he has done. He is a, a native of Seattle. He's a graduate of West Seattle High School. He was a founding member of their foundation and has been involved in raising significant amounts of money to support the student activities there. So he's obviously uh, committed to education for young people. Throughout his public service, he's been an outspoken advocate for environmental protection, public transit, and government reform. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Dow Constantine. Okay, we'll try this lav mic. This is a technological marvel here. No wonder it took a while to get it going. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be able to be here tonight. Uh, how many are students? I mean like current matriculated students, not students in the larger sense. And how many are alumni of, uh, of the college? Okay. And how many just have very dull lives and decide to be here tonight? There we go. Okay, that's good. Exactly. Is there like a new 30 Rock on tonight? Um, and the answer to which discipline there's not a lot of discipline involved in any of it. I just didn't want to get out of college. I loved it here. This is not my only purple tie. I have a lot of them. Uh, I am uh, I'm thrilled to be able to be here. Thank you, Dean, uh, for inviting me, and thank you for your gracious introduction. It really is a, a pleasure to be able to join you tonight uh, and to be named the Dean's Distinguished Lecturer for the College of Built, in, of Built Environments. Uh, politicians. Uh, don't really give lectures, uh, except for maybe Bill Clinton. Uh, they give speeches, right? And uh, this distinction dawned on me maybe a decade ago when I was asked to present at a, a continuing legal education seminar, which I get asked to do from time to time. And uh, I was fretting over citations and statutes and codes and cases wanting to ensure that I did my accurate, lawyerly best as a legal scholar and as an officer of the court. And then I realized finally that I had not been invited to speak as a legal expert. I had been invited to speak as the bumbling, kinetic, political actor that all these laws were intended to constrain. And so I, it was suddenly liberating, freed from the need to accurately recount either the law or the facts. I could just spout my opinion and let all the experts in the audience sort it out. Uh, this was a liberating revelation and uh, one that is as relevant tonight as it was 10 years ago when it came to me. Uh, first, a bit of background and some of which you've heard. I graduated from the University of Washington with a degree in political science in 1984 and uh, after uh, doing a uh, stint of bartending in three different bars to save money for law school, went directly into University of Washington School of Law. And uh, it, we were then in Condon Hall down here on Campus Parkway. Uh, after a few months of that, I decided to embark on a concurrent degree program, uh, both to broaden my perspective and for sanity's sake to get out of Condon Hall uh, for a few hours each day. Uh, and I researched a number of graduate programs, of course, looked into political science because that was my undergraduate, environmental studies, uh, public administration, 
And then I chose to uh, pursue a master's degree in urban planning, uh, elegantly named MUP. Um, why? Why did I choose uh, what was then the College of Architecture and Urban Planning and an urban planning degree? Um, well, I'd always had a uh, particular interest in the physical world and landscapes and cities and buildings. And indeed, in law school, that was to be my focus on real property and environment and land use. Uh, and also, Gould Hall was a lovely place, and it offered a pleasantly short walk from Condon Hall, and it had the advantage of adjacency to both the College Inn and the College Inn pub down below, uh, which provided an excellent opportunity for study. Um, and Dean Dennis Ryan, as well, um, listened to my pleas and took a look at my law school admissions test and determined that the trouble of the graduate records exam would be unnecessary. And so that kind of sealed the deal right there, sold. I'm on to urban planning. Uh, here I found wonderful professors and students and a rich subject matter. I was able to study the broad history of planning uh, with uh, Professor Miller, uh, with Professor uh, Norton, with uh, uh, I studied real property valuation with Professor Rolf uh, in the building construction department. He insists that I was a good student. I remember it differently, uh, but I did learn a little bit that helped me in my legal practice in real property uh, to not get snookered by real estate agents in valuing property. Uh, I studied the urban form, and that was one of the classes in which I excelled, and it was taught by the very elegant Ray Tufts, who is here tonight, still being elegant, right over there. Um, but the highlight, actually, of my uh, urban planning career came early during that first year when uh, we had a midterm and Professor Tufts chose to read my paper as one of the examples of a well-done test, which was a rare occasion for me throughout my dozen years here at the University of Washington. So thank you, Professor, for that. Uh, my lessons about the built environment started much earlier than my admission to the college, however. I uh, started in kindergarten. Uh, my teacher uh, rolled out butcher paper, and this is one of my fondest and really only memories of that year, uh, rolled out butcher paper along the entire length of the classroom and invited us to uh, design our own city block by block over the course of many days, maybe weeks. It's all a bit of a blur now. It was great. It was like an analog version of Sim City. Uh, the teacher was, I believe, Scottish, which might explain her regard for city planning as a basic skill for five and six-year-olds. Uh, but it was a chance to exercise our imaginations and to feel unconstrained by politics or money or building codes. Uh, we could just create an ideal place. The early settlers who came here did the same, except with logs and planks, which it turned out later were flammable. Um, they founded the University of Washington in 1861, uh, when the entire Washington Territory had barely 12,000 residents. This university gives out more than 12,000 degrees every year. And yet, in a city of just a few hundred people, uh, they founded really you know, a few hundred people, most of whom were little interested in college. They founded a university. Uh, they built a thriving deep water port and took advantage of our proximity to California and Alaska and the Far East. And our city engineers established a water system and electrical grid for a great city that at that time existed only in the imagination. They sculpted the land, they built the locks, they regraded and reshaped. Uh, not always wisely, but sometimes. And I was born just about exactly a century to the month after the Denny Party landed in West Seattle, my hometown, now ostensibly a part of the city of Seattle, uh, in another time that was also defined by bold initiatives. So mine is a perspective of someone like some of you who has watched this region over a fair portion of its modern history grow and become more vibrant, and more prosperous. The generation of our parents and grandparents built the interstate highways. They built floating bridges. They passed forward thrust and cleaned up Lake Washington. They put on a World's Fair. 
We're the beneficiaries of a forward-looking, can-do spirit. And we are stewards of their legacy. Uh, but with that growth has come many challenges. Here's how the world looked to me 25 years ago when I was a graduate student at Gould Hall. Growth in the region was unchecked and uncoordinated. There was still vast capacity for development in our rural and agricultural and forest areas. Uh, with suburban zoning standing just about as far as the eye could see. Seattle was still kind of an urban island in a sea of low density development. Instead of Greater Seattle, uh, newspaper columnist Emmett Watson planted his tongue firmly in cheek and championed Lesser Seattle, uh, a Seattle that resisted growth and resisted any aspiration to greatness other than that which was inherent in our own funky moss back selves. He rejected implicitly the audacious name and creed of our founding, New York Alki, or Alki uh, originally, until Alki became shorthand for alcoholic, which is when they changed it to Alki. I grew up down there. <laughs> A young professor uh, came to the urban planning school, I think my second year, uh, Gary Pivo um, arrived with some ideas about clustering rural development to reduce environmental impacts of developing rural areas under the sort of prevailing one house per five acres model. He was a co-founder of a Thousand Friends of Washington, which is now known as FutureWise, and um, it's a group that is a watchdog for cities and counties uh, as we implement environmental regulations. So he took his students on long, sometimes enjoyable, sometimes excruciating van tours uh, of the still largely unprotected King County countryside, uh, an experience that I would have the opportunity to repeat just about 15 years later as a member of the King County Council as we looked to adopt uh, some of the most difficult land use and environmental regulations protect critical areas. My own interest in open space pr preservation uh, grew up around this time when I was in grad school uh, when an issue appeared in very ne nearly literally my backyard. Growing up, the neighborhood kids, uh, my brother and I and the rest of us used this, uh, this wooded, nameless wooded ravine, which is called the gully, only became a ravine when we tried to save it. Um, for, you know, it was, it was, we were free-range kids, and so we had rope swings, and we rode our bikes, and we climbed the hills, and it was several blocks long, right in the middle of this heavily developed neighborhood. And then one day in 1980, a white sign, a mutt board, I wonder if that name is coincidental, uh, went up, announcing a proposal to run a road through our you know, commons, our woods, and build houses down the length of it. And our sleepy little neighborhood, which was fairly apolitical, rallied to the cause. Uh, I joined forces with a group uh, seeking to preserve the ravine. It was a ragtag band of neighbors, which included my brother Blair, who holds an undergraduate degree uh, from the landscape architecture program here in the college. And we had a previously unknown but absolutely fascinating neighbor whom we discovered named Charlie Chong. Uh, we not only saved the ravine, we also learned quite a lot about community organizing and agitating from Charlie. Uh, we became one of the many centers of the initial support for the 1989 King County open space bond issue, which was a $117 million measure that was approved ultimately by a two to one margin. So powered by the growing anxiety that we uh, were losing our last best places as runaway housing demand and increasing property values chewed away at areas that used to be thought undevelopable. Um, open space preservation took on a bit of a life of its own. It seemed like it was going to be unstoppable for just about a year until the region uh, returned to the ballot with a proposed countywide tax on real property sales. Uh, 
uh, to permanently fund open space preservation. We had a good proposal with a catchy name. It was called the Regional Environmental Endowment, or TREE. The voters apparently thought the two ballot measures in two years to save land that they previously thought no one wanted to build on uh, was just overreaching. And even if they didn't, the real estate industry definitely thought so. And TREE got axed at the polls. Uh, King County government, however, several years before that, had recognized that market forces were beginning to change our old assumptions. Um, they were chewing up the countryside. And in 1985, my predecessors on the county council adopted, uh, along with only the second comprehensive plan in the history of the county, the first ever urban growth boundary. And in 1990, the state legislature gave some teeth to the county's comp plan by adopting the Landmark Growth Management Act, which required comprehensive planning in the state's most populous areas. In 1994, King County and its cities affirmed the urban growth area boundary as a bright green line down the center of the county beyond which development of an urban character would not be permitted to leapfrog. As a result, uh, importantly, the zoning changed a lot on people's property, maybe some of yours. Uh, the politicians, the lawmakers of that day made the relatively easy political decision to upzone or increase urban density on the left side, as you're looking at the map, of the line on the urban side. And the extraordinarily difficult decision to download, downzone lands on the rural side. Creation of the urban growth boundary was a watershed event, watershed event so to speak. Uh, now our elected leaders and land use planners would be able to focus infrastructure investments and development inside urban areas and to try to protect our farms and forests and resource lands. Voters supported smart growth by agreeing to pay for farmland preservation. It's a proud moment for King County and one that continues to provide dividends. These would pre prevent the county's vibrant agricultural lands from being permanently converted, uh, paved over by developers. Uh, one of my predecessors, also a West Seattle High School alumnus, was uh, pilloried by his opponents for some time as uh, the developers of the day with whom he had become associated were caricatured as Ted Blacktop. I don't know if anyone around here remembers Ted Blacktop, but he was a mythical person who was busy paving all of East King County. Uh, those were the successes. There were also some notable missteps, and uh, particularly for the students. Sometimes we don't succeed the first time. We need to persevere uh, and be willing to revise and reinvigorate. And we also need to be willing to learn from our mistakes. Uh, what kind of mistakes have we made in our region? Uh, well, we did wash an entire hill into the bay. It was probably a loss of quite a lot of real estate value in modern terms. Uh, we straightened and cleaned our rivers out so the water and everything of value would flow very quickly out of them. Uh, that's something that's going to take us generations to undo. Rail transit was defeated twice at the polls with all of our federal money famously going to build Atlanta's MARTA system. And we're still playing catch up on that. A grand public park and massive redevelopment was proposed on the shores of South Lake Union. Known as Seattle Commons, it was defeated at the polls twice. This, was, this no campaign was kind of one of the last hurrahs of lesser Seattle. We're not going to stand for this development. We're going to keep things the way they are. And as we know, South Lake Union today is exactly as it was then. Bucolic, low rent. No, it is not because nothing stands still, because the land and its value speak. Because things, neighborhoods, economies, people are either growing or they're decaying, they're not static. And we can recognize these forces at work in our built environments and stand up and shape and redirect them for the better. As we do in planning and architecture and landscape and building, that's what we do. Or we can be run over by those forces. Anyway, there, that was the world my generation inherited when we left the School of Urban Planning. 
and it was up to us to decide how we would shape and reshape this world we were inheriting. So as a, a state legislator, and I was elected to the state legislature in 1996, so technically four years after I got my degree, although I had finished my classwork in 1989 and the ensuing three years were filled with, uh, with Dean Dennis Ryan calling me and asking me when the hell I was gonna get my diploma done there, so. Uh, and he finally succeeded. Uh, Dennis was, uh, was fairly persistent. He wanted the slot for someone who was actually gonna be attending class. I was practicing law during this time, which seemed like a priority, but uh, I I'm appreciative forever to the college for having kept the slot open until I got around to doing my professional project and finishing my degree. And it's turned out to be tremendously valuable in the profession I've chosen. As a state legislator, King County Council member, and now as executive. I'm asked to make decisions every day that impact the design and scale and preservation of our built environment. And when I think about how to approach solutions, there's one reality that continually comes back. Uh, superficially, it's the antithesis of the modern movement, but in reality, it's just a description of how people arrange themselves in space. It is the reality that function in the world in which I work follows form. What we build or preserve or cultivate or destroy today influences, in fact, virtually dictates how we will live tomorrow, how development, what development patterns will emerge and how communities will function for generations to come. When I think of infrastructure broadly, I like to think of it in three categories natural infrastructure, human infrastructure, and built infrastructure. Our natural infrastructure in our region is unmatched. Uh, it is what brought many of us here, or keeps many of us here. Mountains and water and forests. People like to go on about it, but the fact is when one goes to another region, you notice the difference immediately. The landscape enchants us and it challenges us and provides natural edges, boundaries for urban growth. And of course, many ecological project, uh, products as well, like cool, drinkable water and building materials and nutritious, secure local food. And we have a duty to protect that natural infrastructure through preserving open space and cleaning up the sound restoring salmon runs and creating new opportunities for people to connect with nature and focusing growth where the negative impacts of so many millions of us can be dealt with in an orderly way. In 1982, King County became the first Washington County to enact a small conservation futures property tax to preserve open space. Fast forward to 2013. The Conservation Futures Program has protected more than 111,000 acres of forests and shorelines and greenways and trails in this county, creating a legacy for succeeding generations to enjoy forever. In 2004, I had the opportunity, uh, as I alluded, to lead the county council's adoption of some of the most progressive environmental regulations in our, in, of our generation. Using best available science, we integrated our critical areas, stormwater, and clearing and grading regulations to restore environmental functions. For years to come, these regulations will help prevent flooding and erosion, and they will protect our drinking water and streams and wetlands. To say that this was not without controversy would significantly understate the situation. Uh, but I will say that in the ensuing decade, I've seen attitudes change significantly, sometimes dramatically, in many of our rural communities. Uh, there seems to be a keener appreciation of what we have and what stands to be lost. And that the threat to the rural way of life, the ability to farm, the ability to conduct profitable forestry, may come as much or more from one's neighbor's desire to make money converting his or her property than 
from an overweening government trying to protect one from oneself. The second key to our prosperity is our human infrastructure. And we are all in this together. Our economy, our quality of life depend on the ability not just of those who are privileged to be educated or come to this with position, but of everyone to contribute. Tonight, long after we leave this hall, staff from my office will be joining thousands of volunteers across this county in the annual homeless count. It's likely they will find the numbers of homeless have increased and that those numbers include a higher percentage of families with children. And that, of course, is not acceptable. The communities in which we live and work and play have a dramatic impact on our quality of life and on our health. Government decisions in areas like land use and zoning and transportation and housing can either create equitable opportunities for good health and success or they can hinder them. Indeed, during that 2004 period, one of the big fights we had was over requiring much new development to be walkable and bikeable, not just drivable, with local services that could be reached on foot. Outrageous social engineering. That's what I was told. That's what you were told. The alumni of this college will have an impact not just on the built environment, but on virtually every aspect of our lives, including especially public health. Lifestyle-based chronic illness is killing our nation. Functions like walking unarguably follow from walkability. The third key to our prosperity is our built in infrastructure, and that is one that concerns us tonight. Uh, my generation has grappled with big projects that have created the capacity for future growth. Our bus system has grown to be the 10th largest in the nation with almost 120 million riders annually. As a result of two voter-approved sound transit measures in 1996 and 2008, we are finally creating the light rail spine around which the region will grow, function following that form, that form of a transportation system, as it does in these infrastructure matters. We built a new regional wastewater treatment plant to protect water quality and public health. We are struggling mightily to maintain our roads and bridges that connect our hills and span our waterways. And soon we will shore up the seawall that keeps downtown Seattle from falling into the bay. Let me speak to those of you in this room who are not old and jaded like uh, some of the rest of us. Uh, the students, you've signed up to make our physical world a different place than it would otherwise be. Some of you have grand plans to remake the world in your image. Some of you may want only a quiet, secure job. But even with all the progress, the challenges you will face are greater and more complex than they were just two decades ago. Rather than settling for a world twisted and molded by the forces around you, you're going to be working with and reshaping those forces. We're already seeing, for example, the reality of the greatest challenge of our century, climate change, rising sea levels and more severe storms and decreased snowpack, and challenging conditions for salmon in our streams. In a climate-stressed future, the role of cities and metropolitan areas is fundamental. Nothing has a greater impact on greenhouse gas emissions than the form of our built environment. Land use and transportation. Those strategies must address climate change. We must continue to build compact, walkable communities. So let me reiterate, speaking specifically about transportation, the transportation infrastructure we choose to build today will create the communities in which our descendants live for generations to come. When we built trolleys in this town, communities grew up, neighborhood business districts popped up at the junctions. When we built an interstate highway system, 
exurbs unfolded across the land, and discount malls popped up at the off-ramps. The transportation we build dictates what our land use is going to look like. Our economy is recovering. It will recover. And open space and healthy habitat will be under ever-increasing pressure as our population grows. We need to forge ahead, and it's politically and economically difficult at times, with protecting and linking key habitat and open space before it's too late. We need to have the political courage to hold fast to the urban growth boundaries so that we can have working farms and forests for future generations. And we have to invest and reinvest in the infrastructure that allows us to grow in the right way, in a smart way. Infrastructure that allows the intellectual capital generated by this university and our other institutions of learning to bear fruit as new, great, and broad prosperity. A prosperity that allows us to turn, uh, in turn, to fund the investments we need in our natural and our human and our built environment. With all due respect uh, to Mr. Craig, who designed Edinburgh's new town, and Mr. L'Enfant, who designed Washington, D.C. originally, and the Olmsteads, who designed basically every place. Um, your job is going to be harder. Drawing a pretty map is entirely insufficient. It's no longer enough to just lay out beautiful and elegant buildings and cities on vellum or on butcher paper on the kindergarten floor. We have to be more nimble in design and function as we integrate all of these other variables that are suddenly wrapped up in our work. The implications of our work are more profound than they were. The designers and planners and builders and developers of tomorrow must have a more sophisticated understanding of the interrelationships and interdependencies of our world. We have to understand the social and environmental systems. We have to integrate public health and equity and social justice into our work. The products we deliver to society must be ever more sophisticated. They have to be adaptable and multifunctional. They have to move and breathe. And they must do all that without losing their beauty and the power to inspire because, of course, the appearance, the symbolism, and the language of our built environment still tell us and others who we are and who we aspire to be. That's what those crazy Denny's who founded the university were doing when they erected four massive columns in the middle of this frontier town. They were not needed to hold up the roof. They were a statement, uh, a statement about who we wanted to be. These days we wouldn't tolerate such architectural silliness. But in more subtle ways, we still build in order to speak. And not just buildings, but landscapes and roads and all manner of construction. A few months ago, at the corner of 15th and Madison, I pushed a shovel into an empty lot. And that corner is now seeing the rise of the region's first moving, breathing, living building, the Bullet Center. The existing regulatory scheme that we planners had helped create uh, was not ready for that building. Uh, it took a lot of political work at the city and the county and the state to enable the project to happen. It just didn't fit the mold. But it is happening. And while we planners work to help decision makers create orderly, consistent, predictable rules, we also can't be servants to old standards that no longer at our reality. Last year, I convened a task force to address the way we cite schools in King County. The state guidelines for, for high schools recommended a preposterous 40 acres for a new school. That's two Safeco fields for a high school. That might make sense out in the middle of central Washington, but it doesn't work that well in a heavily developed urban environment. Just to find a site that large and to save money on land acquisition, many school districts on the urban fringe were looking out to our 
our forests and our farms for those sites for new schools. To build schools so far from the populations they serve stretches the limits of our transportation infrastructure, forces children to be driven long distances to school instead of walking or biking. It means schools are removed from the center of our communities and from parents and from supporters. And it means we lose forever those farms and forests. So working together with our cities and our school districts, the task force fought through superficial differences and found shared values and determined that all new schools should be located inside the cities and rural towns they serve instead of out in the countryside. Just one more little bit of progress in a never-ending struggle and a job well done. So this is the world you need to think about and prepare for. More people, more challenges, more interconnectedness and interdependency. And also, on the good side of the ledger, more knowledge, if not wisdom, and certainly more tools to do remarkable things. I want to thank those of you who've decided to design the landscape or to design the buildings or to build them. Um, we planners have a role as urban designers, as the ones drawing the relationship between the buildings and the landscapes and the infrastructure on the butcher paper on the floor. Uh, but our larger, if considerably less glamorous, role is as the therapists in a grand group therapy session uh, between builders and public health professionals and transportation planners and engineers and environmentalists and scientists and most importantly and ever more diverse people and those they've elected to represent them. One challenge for everyone in this room will be learning how to involve communities and people who haven't traditionally been at the table. You'll have to discover ways, new ways of engaging them in meaningful uh, dialogue to come up with solutions that truly represent our future. This struck me as I was uh, sitting on the chair on the, on, the, on the lawn of our Capitol a few days ago. Shirley and I, and Shirley, by the way, has uh, four University of Washington degrees. So um, <laughs> Shirley and I were, were there for the inauguration. And I was looking around at the crowd, and I was thinking about how America has changed so much. And I'll, although we've been changing steadily, the fact that uh, this wave has now crashed on the beach, and we've recognized ourselves as a genuinely diverse and changing nation is remarkable. Our professions need to keep up with that reality as well. And I, I wrote a good portion of this speech while I was sitting shivering uh, for five hours waiting for the president to get out there and get sworn in. So, uh, but that's what planning, designing, and building is all about. Understanding where we are and reshaping that future that's coming at us. Back down to earth though. Looking ahead, let me outline some of the land use and environmental challenges the older half of us in this room are leaving the younger half of you to solve. Uh, climate change and the willingness to make significant and sometimes painful changes to our transportation land use building standards and personal habitat that will be required to achieve an 80% reduction in climate emissions by the middle of this century. Developing sustainable funding for transit that allows us to plan for the growth that is coming to our region, but also paying attention to our existing roads network and the immense infrastructure needs we have regionally as our roads system, given to us by our parents and grandparents, ages. Continuing the battle to hold the line against sprawl, even as hundreds of thousands and then millions of new residents or either born here or move here. Stopping stormwater pollution from older developed areas from poisoning our sound. Restoring native salmon runs in heavily urbanized environments. Preserving a large integrated system of open space and trails across the region. Developing new, more sustainable visions for river management, reducing risks to people and fostering economic development while restoring the habitat we have methodically destroyed. None of these will be fast 
or easy. If you are in it for the long haul and you're willing to rely on real science and you're ready to make course corrections when warranted and to put up with criticism, then you can leave a worthy legacy. Because it will be physical, it will be built, and it will last for a long time, maybe even longer than you. That's what we do here at the College of Built Environments. There's a lifetime of good problems for you to think about and to solve. So, uh, as to avoid ending on too grand a note, uh, I will close with the top 10 things that didn't teach us in the halls of this college that every urban planner at least ought to know, and these are by the accounting of my planning staff. Sewers. When you get a group of planners together, be it in a classroom or a bar, the conversation will eventually and inevitably turn to sewers. Patience, you won't change the entire world, at least not right away. Cops, when government is faced with a choice of funding either people with badges or people with CAD training, badges always win. The obvious lesson being that planners should be issued badges. Uh, fourth, lawyers. Lawyers just give advice. It's you who must make the value judgments and shape the policy. Fifth, epidemiology. I've touched on public health a couple times, but as public health and planning integrate as a field, being able to spell the word epidemiology becomes ever more important. <laughs> Meetings. Number six, different public meetings require different seating configurations, usually sociopedal, table groupings, theater style. Less frequently, it would be convenient to have them be more sociofugal, is that how you say it? Uh, so as to avoid eye contact with angry constituents and landowners. <laughs> Number seven, builders. They just want to build stuff and get paid like the rest of us, except without the pretense. So just provide them with clear and reasonable rules and more certainty and outcomes, and they will be just fine. Number eight, pride. As a planner, it's not about you. It's about me. <laughs> or people like me, the decision makers you work for and the people who elected them. Planning proposals will rise and fall without regard to your personal charm or your skill. Politics, it's local, and it's not just with the elected officials. It's everywhere. It's in the community and business and in this college. Am I right, professors? And special interest groups and your neighbors. And finally, progress. As President Clinton said in introducing the movie Lincoln at the Golden Globes. Enduring progress is forged in a cauldron of principle and compromise. Sound advice for those of us who are in politics and those of us who are in planning. I want to thank you for choosing to be the builders and the designers of our future. I want to thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. Now get out there and remake this world. Thank you very much. Uh, would like to ask a question or two, and I would be happy to answer them. Anyone have a question? It depends on the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> hey, um, I'm a relative newcomer, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to meet you, but uh, first I'd like to offer you the opportunity to uh, earn the crown jewel in your academic experience and come back for a master's degree in real estate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then two, um, I've spent 20 years in affordable housing, and again, being relatively new to this particular area, um, 
And so I'm trying to, you know, kind of immerse and inculcate myself into that um, sphere. And, and I didn't hear anything in your speech tonight about how this city is growing so rapidly and what the priority is for you and your administration uh, to make sure that um, we don't become another San Francisco, for instance, where it's so expensive, where nobody else can live here but people with money. I think that's a, that's a really great question. It brings up a whole area that I've spent quite a bit of time in, which is trying to keep uh, Seattle a place where working class and middle class people can live. Uh, and we have a pretty robust uh, program funding low-income housing, uh, all the way from, from uh, you know, transition housing for the homeless to workforce housing. Uh, we have a Speaker of the House from Seattle who makes uh, affordable housing, workforce housing, a high priority during every session. We've been able to work with him, get our hotel motel tax extended, and part of that is going to be able to be used to add to the money that comes from the Housing Trust Fund from the state and other county funds to continue to build housing, not just in Seattle, but uh, we're very clear that we want affordable housing to exist in all of our urban centers around the county. Housing is part of the equation, so is, uh, is the job picture. And spend a lot of time trying to keep uh, jobs that you don't have to have a doctorate in computer science to hold. Uh, the tech industry has been a godsend for our region, and a lot of that exists because of the fact that the University of Washington is here. But legacy industries like commercial airplane manufacturing, which are high value added and require a high level of training, are industries that are still accessible to people who do not have that level of education. Somebody can make a good living being a machinist. They can raise a family, they can put their kids through college, they can buy a house. That needs to continue in our region. So I formed, for instance, uh, the King County Aerospace Alliance to work on the infrastructure side of keeping aerospace viable here, not just Boeing, but the 400 suppliers we have. Real property values and demand are a challenge for open space and natural systems. They're also a challenge for, uh, for affordable housing. And I think that we have in place the, the, the right institutions and systems we need. What we need are more resources uh, still in order to make sure we can provide that. I don't know if you're involved with the Housing Development Consortium. Yeah. They're very good community, very well organized. They know their stuff. And uh, in an era of tight resources, it's a battle uh, every year to protect those that we have uh, to subsidize housing and make it permanently affordable. It's, it's also important for the private market to be building housing and building housing styles that are affordable and are accessible to people who are working here. But uh, if you want to have folks who are working in industries where it's minimum wage or somewhat more than that, uh, probably, and, and don't want them driving an hour each direction to get to work, we need to be subsidizing some of that housing. Any other questions? Right. Well, this is sort of related to the uh, homelessness issue, but I've noticed in the city there are an awful lot of urban campers now. And when we talk about kind of maintaining the pristine uh, nature of our area, um, that, that's a problem because they, they aren't very good at doing that. They don't have bathroom facilities. They don't have garbage facilities. And I haven't heard an awful lot of discussion about it, but it sort of brings to mind something that I had read in the tipping point about the broken uh, broken glass syndrome, oh, broken yeah. window yeah. syndrome. It sort of reminds me that you know you get to a point and it starts it's hard to uh, stop that deterioration. Anyway, I just interested in your comments on So about seven years ago, the region came together and launched the 10-year plan to end homelessness. Uh, thus far, and, and the, the cornerstone of it is 
building housing to get people into shelter first and then deal with their other problems and having the services that they need available through that housing. So you find somebody, you get them into the housing, get them stabilized, and then you can deal with psychological issues or addiction issues or domestic abuse issues or whatever those issues happen to be. It's been tremendously successful and we've built over 5,000 units now of, a, of the 10-year goal of 10,000. Um, but with the economic collapse, there are more people who are falling through the cracks, who are losing their jobs, who are ending up in, on a sofa, and then in a car, and then in a tent, and then on the streets. Yesterday we had the periodic meeting of the um, board of the Committee to End Homelessness, which I co-chair. And one of the big challenges we have now is the balance between these permanent solutions, like those I just described, and the emergent need for shelter. And so there's this conversation about what's appropriate shelter, what's appropriate for us to fund, is it appropriate to fund tent cities and recognize them, for example, is that real shelter? Are parking lots where people can car camp proper shelter? Or does shelter have to have hard, wells, hard walls and a roof? The, the conversation um, is not about whether one or the other is uh, important. It's about, with limited resources, where can we best apply the money to ultimately solve the problem? And it's a, it's a really, you know, vexing problem. People um, a little younger than me don't remember the time when there weren't homeless people on the streets regularly. But I tell you, there was a time when there weren't homeless people on the streets regularly. There were some street alcoholics on the waterfront or in Pioneer Square. But thousands of people, including families with children and returning veterans and kids, living outdoors every day, is a reality that's fairly new to America. And it's one that we ought to become blind to. We need to not accept that as normal. And we need to demand solutions to it. We're, you know, there are a lot of resources going into this problem. And the number that was quoted by my human services head yesterday at the Committee to End Homelessness meeting was, I think, $69 million in grants that we're putting out. Um, now, you would think with $69 million, you could basically so solve the whole problem. But, uh, you know, a few people using the system chronically can eat up a lot of money. And so what we're trying to focus on is where we can invest uh, most efficiently to start to reduce the homeless challenge. Uh, there was a guy, I don't know if you were all new to the region back here, but there was a guy uh, who was a city attorney about a decade ago named Mark Sidron. And he decided to try to take it on, not simply by providing you know, supply of housing and services, but by saying, hey, it's not OK to be out on the street begging. And he had these series of civility laws that he tried to have passed. And, you know, ultimately it kind of cost him his political career um, because there was a backlash from folks against that notion. Uh, so, you know, providing supply is part of the equation if people are not either in the right frame of mind or simply willing to take advantage of the um, solutions that are being provided, uh, that is going to be a continuing challenge. I, I guess, I guess, do you think there's not enough um, resources available now to meet the demand? There's not enough. Okay, so there's the housing first. So if you're a, a street alcoholic, addict, mentally ill, there's still not enough housing for us to just get you, take you there, make sure you're safe, warm, dry, and can start calming down a little bit and getting your life back in order so we can provide the services. There also aren't, aren't, there's not enough money for the services. So there have been cuts at the federal and state level to mental illness treatment, for example. We keep trying to make up for that at the local level, but we're constantly propping up the house of cards. And so now we're in a situation where there are mentally ill people on the street getting arrested for minor crimes, being taken to jail, going to court, and because they're clearly not competent to stand trial, we're supposed to be able to send them to the western state to be evaluated and become competent. Western state doesn't have any room anymore. So we can't legally hold them, and they're back out on the streets, probably homeless. 
So these bottlenecks in the system, not all of which are about housing availability, but some of which are about housing availability, are really exacerbating this problem right now. There's a question back here. Dow, I wanted to give you a softball question on historic preservation, but... I am in favor of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I will ask, I live in the rural area. I think the rural areas, their forests provide us with wonderful, clean water. Our farms provide wonderful food sources to people here in the city. And yet, uh, we're a relatively small uh, number of people on a lot of land. And I'm wondering how you see the potential for a shift in resources between the highly urbanized areas and their needs of rural areas and the needs that we have in rural areas for good schools, for good roads, all of the things that make our life in the rural areas as good but different uh, from the urban areas. So it used to be, I'm sure everyone heard the question, it used to be that um, there were, there were a lot of folks living in unincorporated areas, both urban and rural. And so there was enough money coming in from the urban unincorporated areas to the county to be able to pay for the infrastructure in the rural unincorporated areas. Well, the Growth Management Act said urban areas should be in cities. And we at King County take our Growth Management Act very seriously. So we have diligently pursued our obligations to get urban areas into cities where they now pay taxes the local city hall rather than to the county courthouse, leaving us with you to figure out how to pay for. Uh, you know, all these acres in this vast county and a couple hundred thousand of King County's two million people paying taxes to pave those 1,500 miles of road, for example. You know, if you put a little densely populated, unincorporated area in a city, you don't lose very much road, but you lose a lot of tax base. So the state's tax system for local government has not kept up with this reality under the Growth Management Act. And our main legislative priorities involve trying to have the state catch up to that reality, to provide us with local road funding, for example, local road funding options that allow us to pave the roads that two million people from King Pierce and Snohomish use, but only you and 199,000 of your neighbors are paying for. To allow us to run a bus system that is you know countywide and has to go not everywhere but to a lot of places where it's pretty inefficient and yet is really the workhorse of the economy you know, the bus system delivers um, almost half of the people to and from downtown Seattle along with the rail system on a daily basis so it, when I talk with legislators from other parts of the state they think of buses as that little annoyance that the poor people in their communities use because they can't afford a car. Here, it is the backbone of our daily transportation system. And without the funding to keep it running, which by the way, a good chunk of it runs out about a year from now, uh, our economy is going to be uh, severely impacted. So it's, uh, the, it's a challenge talking to a legislature that has its center of gravity outside of uh, our sophisticated urban area here. But uh, we're, we're uh, making progress on helping them understand uh, the challenges we're facing. One of the, and I'll, I'll stop in a second, but so here, here's where this regional collaboration comes in. The roads and transit funding problem in our county Last year, we were fighting with our cities because we were trying to get funding out of the state and we were fighting over who was going to get it. We spent months sitting down with our city leaders and putting aside, as we did with the rural schools task force, the superficial positions we've adopted uh, to fight over, instead talking about shared values. And once we got down to talking about the role of transit, and each jurisdiction's respective need for additional funding to pave the roads, not to, not to create vast new capacity, but just to keep up that which has been handed to us by prior generations, we're able to come to an agreement on a shared legislative agenda to present a unified front to our legislature, which puts us in a much better position to succeed. Several times during my administration, we've adopted that approach of sitting down and having everyone put their cards on the table and, and talk about what it is we're really collectively trying to accomplish for the people. 
and oddly, it works. You know, uh, once folks get done uh, defending their negotiating positions and start talking about why they came to office in the first place, and what they see as the sort of opportunity to uh, advance our region, you can usually come up with agreed solutions. We have one last question, John. Yeah, uh, I think you already answered most of my question. I was going to ask more generally about your your top five regionalization opportunities after four years on the job. I know during the campaign four years ago, I remember you said it was distinctly not the appropriate time to revisit some of these issues. But other than the ones you covered, are there any other thoughts with regard to opportunities for realized efficiencies or uh, whatnot? <laughs> Um, so, could you clarify your question just a little bit? Which which category of things are you asking about? Well, you know, other 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 uh, not only other countries, but other regions. You know, we always hear about Minneapolis, St. Paul, in terms of you know a more regional form of government as a certain uh, of the many disciplines we discuss. You've covered transit, you've covered roads. Are there any other areas where you see opportunities still um, on the horizon to to pursue the approach you just described? Um, I think that there are a number of areas around uh, both human services and public safety where we could do a much better job of coordinating regionally. Uh, we have this very uh, uh, fragmented justice system. We run the Superior Court, we run the felony jail, but then some cities have their own cops and some cities have their own uh, municipal courts and some a group of cities in the south have their own jail. Because public safety is such a huge part of everything we do financially, and because human services, when provided properly, reduce the demand on the criminal justice system, coordinating that across the entire county, offering um, a more rational or logical deal for, for cities to contract with King County to provide those services, sometimes where appropriate and efficient, having King County contract with the city to provide particular services is, um, I think there's an area where there's a lot of low-hanging fruit still. Uh, the problem you get into, and you get, we've gotten into this, what's that? Oh yes, okay. The problem uh, we've gotten into is that, you know, there are real people with real jobs associated with these individual police departments or individual municipal courts, and so you get into turf battles. We are going to be working on coordinating veterans programs across the county. Um, those of you who live in King County have generously voted to create a Veterans and Human Services levy to help with our local response for our returning veterans. There are state and federal programs. It's all very um, siloed, to use the hackneyed term. And one of the initiatives I'm taking up this year, uh, along with our initiative to get 200,000 more people onto health care, under health care reform, is to coordinate and provide uh, kind of a central uh, point of contact, single point of contact for all of those veteran services so that we can help those who've served our country with all the resources that are available and get them the right kind of help that they need uh, rather than having them go from agency to agency to agency. That is something we can coordinate with all of our cities and with the state and federal government and King County as the regional government has a good opportunity to provide that service. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much.